Thank you. Imagine a world where Chicago summer no longer exists. No more five o'clock margaritas after work. No more backyard barbecues. No more enjoying the view from rooftops as the Cubs play the Sox. No more bike rides along Lake Michigan. You will never feel the warmth of the sun on your skin again. All of this is gone. These are all activities and feelings many Chicagoans value and cherish. We would never stop feeling as though something is missing. Our summers are so special because our winters can be so brutal. Hideth is a Welsh word. It does not have a direct English translation. It is classified as a noun that describes a homesickness for a home to which you cannot return, a home that maybe never was, and the nostalgia, yearning, and grief for lost places in your past. There is a large percentage of people with whom we interact each day who have had parts of their identity destroyed. There is a sense of homelessness which immigrants feel when they come to a country and they are unable to return to their home countries, whether it's because of destruction, restrictions, or illness. The feeling of losing home is a loss of identity. I was born in America prior to the current wars to Iraqi immigrant parents who raised me to love and appreciate both cultures. My parents came here amidst the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s. Middle Eastern culture is a large part of who I am and my outlook on life. It's commonly known for its oppression attitude towards women, which is why I am driven towards continuous empowerment for myself and for others. As a child, I was thoroughly excited to one day visit my parents' home country. All children who are born to immigrant parents struggle in similar ways. Many of us have that infamous memory of grandma's house. There's often a scent associated with our grandmothers and their homes. They often had the best food, the most relaxed attitude about watching cartoons all day, and the most discreet way of slipping you a few extra bucks if you left their house. Growing up, my relationship with my grandmother on my father's side was a little bit different. She was never a fan of the cold Chicago weather, so you'd only catch her here in the summer. She spent nine months living at her home in Baghdad and three summer months living with my family in Chicago. At the end of each visit, my nana would hug me so tight, I'd have trouble breathing in anything but her Dolce & Gabbana light blue perfume. I would fight back every tear as we'd watch her walk through the security checkpoint. Her last words ringing in my ears. One of these trips, your parents are going to let you come back with me. Until then, keep sending your letters. Hearing that did not carry much weight for a three, a four, a five, a six-year-old child. But at seven, at eight, at nine, at 10, and 11, visiting my grandmother at her home in Iraq 
became one of my deepest desires. I nagged my parents every chance I got to please send me during any school break or even during school. It doesn't even matter. As a current Chicago public school teacher, I can say it does matter. Send your kids to school. <laughs> every free moment I had was spent dreaming of the day they would finally say yes. My parents denied my requests, their excuse being that I was too young and my presence would be too burdensome for my old grandmother to handle by herself. One remarkable November, on my 12th birthday, I received an envelope that I was less than excited about. I tore it open as my mother urged me to be careful. The airline ticket was overwhelmingly perfect. Mid-June to early August, I would be in Iraq. My parents were going to send me to their home. I was going to see where they grew up, learn life's most important lessons, and experience the beauty of living and growing. It was going to be my first airplane ride, my first time out of the country, and my first time stepping foot into my grandmother's home. In March 2003, America invaded Iraq just four months after my 12th birthday. My two homes at war. At the time, I didn't truly understand what that meant, but my parents decided the trip was too dangerous. I never got to go on that airplane ride. I never got to go to the Middle East. And I never got to see my grandmother's home. Shortly after the war started, my grandmother decided to temporarily relocate to Chicago until things settled down. She packed a few months' worth of items and came to stay with us. After a couple months, she decided to take study and take the US citizenship test. She passed and officially became a US citizen. She has not seen her home since. She never got the chance to pack up her photo albums. She never got the chance to pack up my grandfather's diplomas. And she never got the chance to bring her children's memorabilia. My grandmother is an internationally displaced person. That is, a person who has been forced to leave their native land. While at the time she was not forced to leave Baghdad, it would not have been a wide, wise nor safe decision to stay. The idea of forced migration is no new concept. For thousands of years, people have had their native land torn from under them and been forced to relocate. Others have fled economic disaster, war, religious, and other types of persecution. Their native situations become so unbearable that they decide to move. An internally displaced person is someone who has moved but not crossed an international boundary. While a refugee is someone who is legally living outside of their country of birth, for fear of persecution based on race, gender, political or social affiliation, and religion. After World War II, millions of people were left homeless, without food, and without documentation. When you're afraid you're going to be killed, it's fairly simple to forget your passport at home. As a result, in 1950, the UN General Assembly created the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, also commonly referred to as the UN Refugee Agency. They advocate for international protection rights of all displaced people. In a political paradigm shift, sometimes decisions are made without consideration for human beings. Governments have border protections and restrictions for security purposes. Who they allow into their countries 
is dependent on the structure of that country. Obviously, I have no right to tell any government what to do. But the main concern is when a person is born in a country different from that of their parents. There's already a cultural disconnect, but to then deny them the opportunity to see the land where their traditions, values, and customs were born causes unnecessary turmoil and frustration. Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo are the top five countries of origins for refugees as of 2011. Between those five countries, six million people are displaced. Those six million people are raising children, like myself, in completely different environments with the same values, customs, and traditions. It's only natural to be curious and to want to visit that home country. There are people with whom we interact each day who share the same story. Their ancestors have been forced to relocate. Learn about what you can do by educating yourself on the issues of internally and internationally displaced people. There are resources, but people can only have access if they know about them. Some people leave their home without the intention to ever return. Some people leave and want to visit occasionally. And others leave with the fear that they will never see that place again. When my parents take my brothers and sister and I back to Iraq, it will be comp there will be an enormous disparity between the place it was then and how it stands today. The streets will be totally changed. The people will be totally new. And society will function differently. But what they learn there and who they became there is what we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. At the beginning of my time up here, I asked you to imagine Chicago without its summer. Chicago without its summer is me without my home. Thank you.